All right, we'll go. We're gonna add some more practice for Alkene's reactions today, and um, add one new mechanism as well. Um, and then that that's kind of gonna be the. I think this is the last major reaction for alkenes. There might be one more, um, but either way, we'll we'll spend some time on to get comfortable with them, and then we're going to start moving on and start adding in other functional groups as well. Um, most of the most of the react or the products that we we're going to make through these addition reactions can go through further reactions. So I think the largest chunk of this quarter is going to be talking about oxygen containing compounds because they tend to be rather important and there's a wide variety of different um, oxygen containing functional groups. So from here, we'll, we will start talking about um, some of those oxygen containing reactions. After I think we're going to do free radical reactions first once we're, now that we're comfortable with mechanisms. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and so this is where we ended the other day. So to review um, the oxymercuration, demercuration, let's start with with uh, practicing some synthesis questions. Um, what alkene would we want to start from and what um, and what uh, reactants would we use if we were trying to make these compounds? So take a few minutes, give that a try, and we'll go through some answers here in a minute. All right, so there are really two pieces to these problems. Oops, I'm no, sorry, it's my other computer telling me I'm still muted. Um, <clears throat> got, got a lot of moving parts going on here. Um, all right, so how could the following compounds be synthesized from an alkene? So there, the two pieces to this are we need to know what the alkene is, and we need to know what the reactants are that go along with the alkene. And so for all of these that we've been doing so far with alkenes, um, whatever's on one side, we're, they'll start with a double bond, with a pi bond, and we're going to break that pi bond and add something to each side. And thus far, it's been, a, for the most part, a hydrogen on one side. We're adding whatever else is reacting, basically, to the other side. Um, and oxygen is frequently a place where we can look at these compounds and divide them up. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. Um, oxygen is usually a good place where we can divide them up because it's a nucleophile. That gives us a spot where we can look at and say, okay, each of these, on one side of the oxygen or the other, we're gonna draw a line 
and use that line as sort of that's the two molecules that are going to be coming together in the addition reaction. So, and in theory, there's there's multiple options. There's two options for each of these because each oxygen has two bonds, right? So for all of these ones that are ethers, we could split it up on either side of the oxygen. Um, in this case, a lot of times, whatever your larger component is, is what you're going to want to use is your alkene, and your smaller component is what you'll have it reacting with the alkene. Um, so for A, there are a couple options what we could have that we could have react. If we started with cyclopentene as our alkene. And then the reactants could either be, we could either do an acid catalyzed alcohol addition, or we could do the oxymercuration if we're worried about rearrangement. We're not worried about rearrangement in this case. So acid catalyzed um, hydration would work just fine. So we could just be plus water. And then you just need an acid present. H2SO4, you could just write it as H3O plus. Um, since I'm doing this on the tablet and I want to keep it legible, I'm going to write H plus. Technically, H3O plus is a better thing to write than H plus. They're both just saying we need acid, though. Um, the other, or sorry, and it would not be H2O, right? We would be reacting ethanol. in this case, because we're not just trying to add an OH group, we're trying to add an ether. So we would want, you can either use the shorthand F-E-T-O-H or just write out CH3, CH2OH. And so that's because the oxygen is gonna then act as a nucleophile after we get to that intermediate and then we're going to just do a proton transfer step at the end to drop off that hydrogen from the ethanol. Sorry, um, there's an extra hydrogen on, um, so it's CH3CH2OH. Right, because if it didn't have that, then the oxygen would only have one bond and that would be a negative charge on that oxygen. So that would be ethoxide. <laughs> Okay. Not not ethanol, which you could do, but if we're in acidic conditions, we can't have ethoxide as a reactant because ethoxide's a strong base. So we would we would just want to have it that present as ethanol. What could we use for B? There's, again, there's a couple options for which alkene we could use. And then two options for react for our reactions. So if we started with methyl cyclohexene, then and in this one we are only adding an OH group. So we, it is going to be reacting with water, and we could either write it as oxymercuration, demercuration, or as acid catalyzed hydration, because again, we're not worried about rearrangement. We're trying to add the oxygen to the more, most substituted carbon as it is. So even if it did rearrange, it would give us our desired product that way. But just for the sake of reminding ourselves how we would write the oxymercuration reaction is two steps. And so above, I'm going to write it off to the side so I can write it larger. It's mercury OAC2 comma water. So the mercury acetate is what's going to break the double bond and prevent the rearrangement. And we'll go through that mechanism again in a minute. And then the water is what's going to add to the other side of the pi bond. Right, so the 
if it was we wanted to add something that wasn't an OH group, we would substitute that water for an alcohol, just like we do with the acid catalyzed hydration. And then the second step, you have to still write this step, even though it's pretty clear after step one, which route we're going, what reaction we're looking for, because it has mercury in it, you still have to include the second step or you wind up with a product that still has the mercury included. And the second step was that sodium borohydride, NaBH4. Right. And all that does is it reduces the mercury to its to its metallic state and removes it from the organic molecule and replaces it with an H. And this would be really important if we were trying to avoid adding or a rearrangement happening. If our molecule could rearrange if it went through a carbocation intermediate, you, then you have to use the oxymercuration route because the oxymercuration route does not allow a rearrangement. All right, so the C and D are going to look like you have to pick one of these two reactions and just pick an alkene for either of them. And the for either of these, neither of these will go through a rearrangement for C and D. So you could pick either reaction again. It's just a matter of picking what's my alkene that I'm starting with and what's my alcohol that I'm going to be adding. So for the first one, you could either you could do Butene, does it matter if it's two butene or one butene? Would they give us different reactant or different products? No, because it'll wind up being symmetrical, right? We're, both of these are Markov Markovnikov reactions. So there's both going to add your nucleophile to the more substituted carbon. So if you started there instead, you're still going to add the, the alcohol to the same spot. So either of those works. Um, and that's the same thing we'll see for D. There's two options for which, which um, alkene you use. And then it'd be plus ethanol again. And for D, for D, it's still going to be butane or butene, just with a methyl group. And again, doesn't matter where you put the double bond in this case. You even put it on the whole other end of the molecule if you use acid catalyzed hydration and let it rearrange. And then your alcohol, in this case, would not be ethanol. It would be methanol, also written CH3OH. All right. So these synthesis problems, especially at this point where we, we're not getting into to a ton of steps in a row, these synthesis problems are really about how do I look at the molecule that you want and break it up into the pieces that you want to start from. Um, and specifically, this one says, how can they be synthesized from an alkene? If it just said, how they, could they be synthesized? Instead of doing an addition reaction, you could do a substitution for these two, right? If instead of have, if you just had a good leaving group where you wanted to add your nucleophile, you could just do an SN2 reaction. So Sean, when we're doing these um, 
problems. Like my only concern is just trying to figure out what um, to react the alkene with, but it looks like, will we always just be focusing on, on whatever group has the oxygen or is that not a hard fast for, rule? For these, for these reactions, yeah. Okay. And, and really you, when you look at these, at these molecules, even if it's not a synthesis problem, your first thought should be, you know, what's the most important, what's different about this molecule? Where is this molecule not just an alkane? Alkanes are our, like bottom level, our base level organic compound. They're less reactive than pretty much everything else. So you're always looking at what's there that's not an alkane. Right, and so in this case, these are all, all oxygens that are being added. And that's going to be pretty common for these. That's um, for these addition reactions. Although it could be if we wanted to add a bromine to a certain spot, then we, it wouldn't be H plus plus an alcohol. It would be HBr would be our reactants. Because it's always going to be we're breaking the pi bond and adding something to each side, right? So if we want, if we want to pick what we're adding to each side, you change your reactant to reflect that. Okay, but um, so what we're combining it with though is dependent on, I'm, I'm just confused, um, like how you knew it was like ethanol or <clears throat> um, like C3, eight or H3OH, CH3OH. Um, okay. So remember how back on the first one, how I, I drew that line to say, okay, this is, you know, the, the oxygen is the part of this molecule that's not an alkane, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and the oxygens, oxygens are good nucleophiles, which is what we're looking for, for an addition reaction. It says from an alkene. So that means we're going to need a nucleophile that can come in here and add to one side of the alkene bonds. Mm -hmm. So for all of these, if you just start from by drawing a line between the oxygen and the rest of the molecule on either side of the oxygen, frankly. Mm -hmm. Usually because ethanol and methanol are really cheap and common ingredients, we would want to have those draw the line so that they have the oxygen to start with, the methyl group and the ethyl group. But in theory, we could just as easily have and gotten just as good of yields likely if we drew the line right there, if we started with this butane that had an OH on it and ethene. Mm -hmm. But the, the oxygen is our point of interest here because it's a nucleophile and because it's the part of the molecule that's not alkane. Okay, well, and then for example, with B, I mean, I would have no idea that that's that I had to even take multiple steps, especially since like, um, like the mercury and the OAC and the sodium um, boring or I like has nothing to do with our end compound. So that's that's going to basically these different reactions we can use. You can think of them as different tools in your toolbox that are going to allow you to pick where you add something. Okay. And so it's it's one of those we're just going to keep we're going to keep adding reactions on there. So addition, the substitution and elimination reactions were always centered around a good leaving group, right? Mm -hmm. The addition reactions are always centered around an alkene, but there's a couple different options for how we can do it. And we're gonna you're basically going to have to to memorize those reactions and or at least you know have sort of red flags. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. It's just plus acid. That means it's just going to go through a carbocation or, oh, that one has mercury in it. That one doesn't go through a carbocation, but they're all going to do basically the same thing. Just, oh, they're going to change where you add that next nucleophile. Okay. Um, I mean, this is just kind of messy for me to look at it. So if it's, are, do, are we going to have like a better cut and dry? Like, I don't know. Is that something you can find online? Yeah. Um, actually, your textbook has it. Okay. Let me pull up the textbook and clear this mess. Actually, I want. 
let's climb. Um, if you just go to the to the end of chapter eight, all of these chapters, just like like uh, last quarter, have a review at the end. And as we start adding more reactions, we're we're going to start having more review material at the end. So we haven't added most of these yet, but we added HX. X is just any halogen. Um, so this is our HBr edition, HCl edition. Here's our acid acid catalyzed hydration is right here. Here's our oxymercuration that we just that we just went through. Um, where's the one we're going to add today? Today we're doing the anti Markov Nikov reaction. We're going to add number four in there, and probably number two. But that's that's what these chapters are basically going to be is, OK, here are the reactions. And you'll notice that these um, three and four both just add an OH group. What allow, what's unique about them is that they allow us to control where we add it. So we're going to be looking for what are the reaction conditions that kind of give us the clue, oh, this is the anti-Markovnikov. This is the Markovnikov. And it's just going to take some practice because it is a new language, basically. Um, but we'll get there. At the very least, after last quarter and, and laying a good foundation, all the mechanisms should make sense, even if it does turn into a bit of memorizing at this point while you get used to writing mechanisms. Um, and so here, this one might be, let me actually clean this up a little bit bits. Uh, that's what I want to do. So if we wanted to start from Sorry, my slides are getting mixed up out of order. There we go. Um, how can the following compounds be synthesized from 3-methyl-1-butene? So in this case, they're not just saying any alkene. They're telling, they're saying, this is your reactant. How do I make A versus B? So you might want to start with drawing the reactant that you have to work with. So one butene, the methyl group on carbon three, if we want to put an OH group on the tertiary carbon, how could we do that? Um, like a Markovnikov addition? So Markovnikov addition, and Markovnikov's rule was that you put the OH group, you put that the nucleophile goes on the more substituted carbon. So both of our addition reactions, all of our addition reactions so far follow that rule. Sean, how could we get how could we get the OH all the way over there, RJ? Oh no, never mind. I was looking at different. So could you do a hydride shift? We could do a hydride shift if we did a rearrangement. Because if, if we started with with an acid catalyzed hydration, if we just said H3O plus. The first thing that's going to happen, our intermediate would that we would make, we'd add a hydrogen to the to carbon one to put a positive charge on carbon two, which then would rearrange, right? Because if it if we moved over a hydrogen from the tertiary carbon, we wind up shifting the hydrogen over. Yeah. 
It's not the whole methyl. And now when the water comes in and attaches, it's going to attach to the tertiary carbon. So Sean, this is Sorry. Catalyzation uh, hydrogen. RJ and then Elkie. Sorry, Sean, so this is an acid hyd catalyzation hydration, correct? Yeah, so technically I should have plus H2O written over here. Okay, sorry, the no carb carbocation intermediate at the top kind of threw me off. I thought that it wasn't gonna have that carbocation and that's why I was like, oh, I looked at it different. That's, sorry, that's left over from the, um, when we were talking about oxymercuration. Okay, okay, gotcha. So oxymercuration will not rearrange, acid catalyzed hydration will. That's that, the difference yeah, between yeah, those two mechanisms. Elke? I was just gonna ask you what it's called. So my answer or my question was answered. Okay. So the answer to the, this question, how could the following compounds be synthesized for, from three methyl one butene? is just you draw the 3-methyl-1-butene plus H2O with an acid catalyst. That is your answer right there to this question for part A. And then if you really wanted to be complete, you could, you could draw out your product. For B, we're starting from the same molecule. But we want to go to but we want to go to adding the OH to a carbon without rearrangement. Casey? Yeah, I was gonna ask. So with the uh, oxymercuration, we don't get rearrangement with the acid catalyzed H2O, we would. Correct. Okay. And to go back to the same terms that we, that we were using earlier, they're both Markovnikov additions in that you're both, both of them are trying to add the OH to the more substituted carbon, but the, but the oxymercuration does not allow rearrangement and acid catalyzed does. So that kind of answers our question for B, right? We want to go through a similar intermediate, but we don't want it to rearrange, which is, which means, tells us it needs to be oxymercuration. That is the key aspect of oxymercuration that separates it from acid catalyzed. So it's still going to be H2O plus this compound. We're just going to do it with that mercury OAC2, mercury two acetate is gonna be the, the catalyst. And it's not really so much a catalyst as a reactant actually in this case, because it does get used up as we do this. Because remember it makes a covalent bond and then in step two, it doesn't get regenerated. It gets turned, gets reduced all the way to metallic mercury. So it's not, strictly speaking, a catalyst. Um, although to, to make it clear what's being added and what is not being added at the end of the reaction, it frequently gets written above the arrow like that, just to sort of distinguish it's not going to wind up added to our final product. It's another case of organic chemists playing fast and loose with balancing rules. And then the second step, you have to include this, and it's just sort of, it, it always is the second step to oxymercuration, but you have to write it, is that 
you then expose it to sodium borohydride. And then our final product, we keep the methyl group where it was. We didn't rearrange or charge, so our OH gets added to carbon two. And this is, you guys know that when I don't have a good way to teach things by now that my only tool early is repetition. Um, and so we'll keep going back over the mechanisms and, and going through the mechanisms. But when push comes to shove, if the mechanisms aren't making sense, start trying to memorize these things and remember what the, what are the key aspects of these different reactions. Markovnikov, no rearrangement. Those are the key aspects of the oxymercuration. And if I was listing key aspects of acid catalyzed hydration, it would be Markovnikov with rearrangement. And again, the, the synthesis questions require you guys to think about it on two levels, right? You have to think about where you're going and what you would have to do to your reactant to get there. These are the trickier problems, which is why we're doing them as the review problems now. The more basic level questions are going to be questions like, oh, let me clear that. Um, and there's lots of them in the um, in the practice problems here. So predict the major product for each of the following reactions. Where it's not it's not you know how do I make this? It's just these two are put together. What happens? So that's those are simpler even because it's not sifting through. Okay, what are the various various um, things that I need to do for this reaction to happen. It's just these two things react. What does it do? Um, and we haven't added all of these other ones yet, so don't worry about those yet. But I was just showing you that this is the, the more straightforward way to ask questions and the more common way that you will see them. Say on a on a quiz or something like that. All right, so to recap where we are so far in addition reactions, we can do Markovnikov addition with, with uh, our binary acids, meaning HCl and HBr and HI which is really just acid catalyzed hydration where we add a halogen, right? We can do acid catalyzed hydration with water and with alcohols to make alcohols, make an alcohol and ether respectively. And we, we have oxymercuration demercuration, which is Markovnikov with no rearrangement. Those are our three mechanisms. There's a lot of different reactions buried in there, right? but that we only have done three mechanisms so far in this chapter. So what do we do? We start adding more mechanisms. We'll answer some questions here first though. Um, the last one in particular, we're gonna, we're going to, um, we're gonna talk about in a little bit more detail, but give you guys a little bit of a breather and answer your random questions first. How is OCHEM related to forensic science? Well, lab on Tuesday is a really good example, right? We talked a lot about TSA and testing for, for drugs to determine what something is. Um, you know, For instance, if there was a crime scene that had a, a random white powder scattered all over a kitchen table, 
odds are the investigators who want to know what that white powder was. Is it anthrax or is it cocaine? Um, that probably plays a role in what happened there. Um, so a huge chunk of how OCHEM applies to forensic science is just what is this thing? What is this? And why would somebody want it? Or why would it hurt somebody? Um, it's also related to th things like how do, how do certain compounds break down over time? Um, it's going to be tied to OCHEM and what the conditions are. So they can, so a lot of times talking about, um, you know, the, the chemistry behind why, why urine tests can detect some drugs for three weeks and other drugs are out of your system in two days. That's all tied to the OCHEM and how your body processes biochem as well, but they're tied together. Um, and also how long a sample has been left out, you know, decomposition rates, not just of, of living things, but also of um, random compounds is going to depend on conditions and kinetics and how stable the various compounds are. Um, you know, for instance, if there's some some drug residue was found in in uh, inside a um, inside someone's house, but it's no longer the active form of the drug because it had been six months or a year, an organic chemist would be able to come in and say, "Well, yeah, it's not cocaine now, but it was six months ago," um, with some degree of certainty. And so things like that are are really you know um, in a chemist's wheelhouse, forensic chemist's wheelhouse. Um, and if you do want more information about forensic science, you can always I guess you can't go ask Millie anymore because Millie doesn't work at the college anymore. Um, but you guys remember Millie, who used to be the lab manager before Mariola, um, was a she was a forensic chemist in Georgia for. I want to say she, for like 10 years or something like that, she was a forensic chemist when she got out of, um, out of undergrad. Um, and her, she said her job was basically, here's a packet of white powder. Make sure it's cocaine like we think it is. Here's a packet of brownish powder. Double check that it's heroin um, to basically support the arrests that the officers made. Uh, and if you want a good, a good uh, scandal-related TV show, it's a miniseries. Um, related to that is uh, on Netflix. I think it's called How to Fix a Drug Scandal, um, which is the two forensic chemistry labs in Massachusetts. There are only two forensic chemistry labs, and they both had scandals going on at the same time in the in the early 2000s, um, where they basically had to throw out like tens of thousands of drug arrests. Um, and so it's all about the the social justice aspect of that. Like, well, do they did they actually go and do that or not? And it turns out that uh, unless they had lawyers leaning on them, they just kind of ignored the fact that they wrongly imprisoned all these people um, until lawyers had to come in. They, they knew that they had a problem, but they didn't want to reverse the convictions. So they just kind of like didn't tell anybody. Um, and then, you know, that didn't last for long. But um, the second question here is a good question for this is a chemical engineering question, really, and it's related to CFCs that we've mentioned before. Um, they still use fluorocarbons or and chlorofluorocarbons, which CFCs, to aerate styrofoam. It's one of the one of many reasons why styrofoam is particularly bad for the environment. It's not just that the styrofoam itself is bad for the environment; it's that the process of making it uses another compound that's really bad for the environment as well. Um, but basically, chlorofluorocarbons are used in this, the same reason that they're used in refrigerants. It's Freon, basically. It's a chlorofluorocarbon. Um, they're used in aerating styrofoams for the same reason that they're used as, as refrigerants, and that's that they go through a phase change close to room temperature. And so what they would do is you would take this styrofoam, which is a polymer called polystyrene, which is not naturally have that that puffy shape to it. Um, but what you can do is you can soak it in chlorofluorocarbons and then make the compound and the chlorofluorocarbons don't get any chemically included. So they're basically just dissolved in this polystyrene mess. Then if you heat it up, they all evaporate. And when they evaporate, they turn into a gas. And when they, so it's a lot like um, dough rising. Basically, when you make, when you allow bread to prove, 
you make these this gas molecule that's trapped by these polymers and that causes it to puff up. Um, and then you can be basically, you would recollect the freon because it then can recondense and you can reuse it and try to not allow it to escape into the um, environment. Um, but that's why they were, they were traditionally used. I believe they're still used to make styrofoam. They don't have a better process. Styrofoam is being phased out anyway. So nobody's really working on making styrofoam more environmentally um, friendly because it's by its very nature, it's not environmentally friendly. So why bother trying to make it better right now since most developed nations are trying to limit its use anyway. Um, but and it's the chlorofluorocarbons are used not just because they have they're actually really really inert at atmospheric pressure um, at the surface. The reason they got used as freon in the beginning they, is that chemists and engineers thought that they were kind of a miracle material, um, in that they don't have they don't react with anything really when you're at sea level. Problem is, is that when they're released into the upper atmosphere, they get hit with a different level of radiation than they do at sea level. So they're lighter than air, so they raise to the top of the atmosphere, and then they get hit by more intense UV light. When they get hit by really intense UV light, they they do break apart and become reactive, and that's what caused the hole in the ozone layer. And that's why nobody saw it coming until it started happening, is because what well, what do you mean? These are really, these are inert gases. Why are you worried about Freon? Um, and that's, that's exactly why is because they didn't take into account different conditions elsewhere on the planet. They're still really good refrigerants, but we don't use them anymore. We have better, better systems now. Um, Last question, I'll go fast because I don't know astronomy very well and then we'll take a break. Um, actually, we'll talk about the last question and then we'll take a break. Um, if you have multiple rings within a big ring that you can clearly see the difference on, they're, you, they're usually, it is partly due to electron clouds, um, but it's more that you have to think about the rings as, be, they're not, distinct objects, right? They're just clouds of particles. It's so when you have distinct rings, it means generally means that they're made up of different materials. And a lot of times it, that's because they came from different sources. So what will happen if you throw an asteroid at Jupiter into, and you throw it within, it's called the Roche limit. Um, the Roche limit is how close an object can get to a or a, a planet can get to a larger planet without being ripped into pieces by tidal forces. Um, if you throw an asteroid into orbit around Jupiter within the Roche limit, it'll get torn apart into pieces and you'll get a ring structure forming. Um, but if you do that with an asteroid that's made out of iron and you throw it at a, with a specific amount of energy, you'll get a ring that's this color and this shape and this distance from the planet. If you throw a comet that's mostly made out of ice and you throw it harder, you might get rings that are further away from the planet and that are a different color because they're made out of ice and not iron. So generally speaking, I think the multiple rings that they see, especially around Saturn, but you can see it around Jupiter too. Um, and I wanna say Uranus even has a, has a ring system too, a really faint one. Um, are generally due to the fact that they came from different sources and are different ages as well. Because most of these ring structures will eventually either fall into the planet um, due to gravity, or they will coalesce into a moon of that planet if you give it enough time. Um, so th on a, you know, that's on an astronomical scale, literally on an astronomical time scale. So it's it's a really long process but in theory Saturn's rings will go away eventually and they'll Saturn will either have one or two more moons or they will all be sucked into the um, Saturn itself they're not typically in stable orbits um, but again it's been a long time since I took physics and I never did take an astronomy class so this is all just self-taught and I might be way off base with some of that um, so ask Kathy when you take astronomy 
last but not least, the one that's actually relevant. When we, when using a strong base and nucleophile, can all of them be paired with heat to force reaction to follow elimination pathway? Generally, if you have a strong base that's also a strong nucleophile, heat is the more is the more universal way to force it to go through the elimination because we're going to favor that entropy side of that delta G equation. Um, you have to be careful with that. You can't force it too far because otherwise you just start burning your stuff up. You wind up with other reactions happening, especially if there's oxygen around. Um, but in general, yeah, any base can be used, although we typically would want to use a base that would normally favor um, elimination anyway. So something like if we were trying to force something to go through elimination, we would want to um, use a sterically hindered base because sterically hindered bases don't go through substitution as easily, right? Um, but you could, in theory, use um, sodium methoxide because that's a strong base if with heat, um, you also have to be very careful because if you get, if it's an exothermic reaction and you're adding heat to it, things can get very hot very fast um, in a practical sense. Like for instance, um, diluting concentrated sulfuric acid is actually a very exothermic reaction because it's sulfur is, or hydrogen sulfate is so good at giving up its first proton that you wind up with it being downhill in energy a lot. And so if you do that at room temperature and you're not careful, um, you can do something like I did once and I, I actually shattered a glass bottle um, that I was diluting sulfuric acid in because I let it get too hot too quickly. Um, so you do have to be careful with exothermic reactions about adding heat to get it to go one way versus the other. There are practical concerns there. But in theory, you should be able to do that to force it to go elimination by controlling temperature, or at least the major product. You're still going to have some impurities in there. But um, And then when adding, uh, we've talked about the Markovnikov as well. Um, so when and are at this point, every reaction that we have it, every addition reaction we have is a Markovnikov addition. And that's a perfect place to stop because we're going to change that when we come back. So let's take 10 minute break, come back at nine and, uh, and we will add another mechanism.
All right, let's let's start coming back here. And I know we've already spent some time on non directly related things, but I just happened to cross this and thought that this was was uh, both entertaining and educational. Somebody somebody took all the different amino acids and paired them with Pokemon evolutions. Um, if you grew up playing the original Pokemons like I did, um, this is very actually effective at ways to remember these because alanine, phenylalanine, and tyrosine are really all very related to each other. Alanine, you add a phenyl group to alanine, you get the next evolution, which is charmeleon. I mean, phenylalanine. Um, and then you add an OH group to that and you get Charizard. Um, I just saw this and I thought that this was kind of funny. And they actually did, somebody who actually knows the chemistry was actually paying attention to this because there's like the two different parallels. There's the, the um, oh shoot, what are they called? Nidoran and Nidoran female, Nidoran male that are really the same thing, like, like aspartic acid and glutamic acid and asparagine and glutamine. Um, when when people actually pay attention to the small changes like that 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 uh, that warms my heart. So I just thought I'd share that with you. Um, all right, here's another example. If you wanted to look at the does it rearrange or not, and following Markovnikov's rule, we'll do these ones quickly here. So acid catalyzed hydration, except it's not hydration. We're adding an alcohol instead of just an OH group. So our top reaction is going to go through an intermediate that can rearrange and move a methyl group. So our product here would be adding an isopropyl group isopropyl ether on carbon three. Whereas our second reaction, which does not allow for rearrangement. So if it doesn't allow for rearrangement, all of our carbons stay where they are. So we still are adding our isopropyl ether we're just adding it a carbon two instead of carbon three. And we don't move a methyl group around. All right, it makes sense to everybody. And again, repetition, looking at the reaction conditions to determine which of these pathways we go through, that's, what gives you all the information you need. So let's add a new reaction. We're adding a new mechanism and as everything to this point has been Markovnikov, we're now going anti-Markovnikov. Um, and anti-Markovnikov starts with, with um, borohydride, boron, boron trihydride, I believe is the um, name here. And the THF in this is, that's just the solvent. THF stands for tetrahydrofuran. Um, but BH3, boron trihydride, is is so reactive that you can't um, do this in, in very many solvents at all. You need a very non-polar, um, actually, you need a polar solvent, but you can't have it be a reactive polar solvent. And so THF, tetrahydrofuran, furan looks like a... a cyclopentyl group, it's a pentagon, where one of the carbons is replaced with an oxygen, and then you have two double bonds. So this is actually an aromatic compound that's about as stable as benzene, because it has a lot of resonance that can happen here. Um, but if you wanted to make it so that it was 
slightly more polar tetrahydrofuran that you've added four hydrogens to this, um, which means you don't have these double bonds anymore. So that's tetrahydrofuran. It's a ring structure, it's cyclopentane where you replace a carbon with an oxygen. Um, and this is advantageous because it's very non-reactive, um, slightly polar, um, and basically will not react with the sodium borohydride the way that anything with more electrons will, while still being polar enough to allow the reaction to happen. So all that to say that THF is important to this, but it doesn't play a role in the mechanism. So just don't be too worried about where it shows up there. Um, and the, the advantage to this, these two reactions, which are known as hydroboration oxidation, is that we get an anti-Markovnikov addition. Right, so this is our third tool now for adding an OH group. We can add an OH group, Markovnikov with rearrangement, Markovnikov no rearrangement, and now anti-Markovnikov. So that basically now we can put an OH group anywhere we want if we have a double bond. Um, and this one is it's interesting and it's only results in what's called syn addition, S-Y-N. Syn means the same. Um, we use thin Sin and anti, um, as opposed to cis and trans, because we, we're going to wind up making, we won't necessarily make the trans or the cis product, because the addition, sin ref refers to the process of the addition, not what the product is. It's a very subtle difference. It means that we're adding an H and an OH to the same side. But if you think about drawing the skeletal structure of these products, skeletal structure, we wouldn't show the hydrogen, right? And so if you didn't have the hydrogen there, the products, oh, look at that, I can kind of erase stuff. That's kind of cool on my figures that I didn't even make. Um, if you imagine not being able to see those hydrogens, the methyl group and the OH are trans relative to each other, but the addition was syn. So that's why we have two different terms that are kind of describing the same thing as syn versus anti is referring to the process of the addition, not the product. Cis and trans is referring to the product. Subtle difference, but that I'm just trying to explain why we have an, a, another new vocab term for describing where stuff is. Um, and that tells us a little bit about the mechanism. If we know that our addition is only happening in the sin pathway, that means that it can't be going through a carbocation inter intermediate of any sort because if it did then that, that would be planar right it can't be a an intermediate that is going to um allow it to add both of our big groups on the same side all right so and again when we want to show what the possibilities would be and that they don't happen here's another type of reaction arrow that's pretty intuitive to use don't do that. It does not do that. It's what that's showing. Right? And so the, the key to the mechanism here is that it happens in two different steps. First thing is you get this, what's called hydroboration. Um, and anytime you get, you have boro, um, borohydride, which would be BH4 with a negative charge, or BH3. Um, they're somewhat unique in they're really good sources of H minuses, of hydrides. So probably what's going to happen here is something that involves giving away a hydrogen where the hydrogen keeps the electrons. Um, and that is, in fact, what we see. Um, and 
if you look at the electronegativity values, hydrogen versus boron, they're close to the same electronegativity, so they can form a strong covalent bond, but hydrogen is more electronegative. So when you break a hydrogen off of a boron bond, the hydrogen keeps the electrons, which all of a sudden, a hydrogen with a negative charge, if you think about that, what, what other molecules have we been dealing with that have a negative charge? What other reactants have a negative charge? What have they been oxygens? doing, Cody? Maybe oxygens? Oxygens, hydroxides, right? And chloride and bromide, oxygens that are on alcohols, they're all acting as nucleophiles when we do that, right? So what's unique about hydrides is it allows you to have a hydrogen act as a nucleophile. Normally, hydrogen is an electrophile, right? Because normally the hydrogen has a partial positive. So by having hydrogen act as a nucleophile, that's why we get an anti-Markovnikov reaction here. Because the hydride is going to act the same way that the oxide would in our other reactions. And so what happens when you put the boron trihydride with an alkene is you actually wind up with the hydride moves to the more substituted carbon and you wind up making a covalent bond between the boron and the less substituted carbon. Um, and this little symbol up here at the top, that is, that is the way of saying that we're not showing an intermediate. That's the way of indicating that's the transition state. Um, the, old, the old school typographic way of drawing, that's, that's called double dagger, is that symbol is known as double dagger because if you actually look in old dictionaries and stuff like that, they have a little typographic index and the symbol actually looks like like that. Um, so it was literally two knives pointing at each other um, is what that typographic symbol looked like. So that's why we call this symbol double dagger. Um, and all it's indicating is it's, a, it's the high energy state. It's the transition state between these two things, um, which is why we can have multiple, more than four bonds at a time being drawn to a carbon because we're showing them breaking and forming at the same time. I just always found double dagger to be very interesting. Next time you're reading, if you ever read an old print textbook again that has some of this stuff, like typically, it's, you know, had old dictionaries had the super, super thin paper um, that was like so thin you could almost read through it. Like that era of textbook um, and reference manual had these double daggers in it. I grew up being told every time I couldn't. Um, now that I have kids of my own that are learning to read, I think that my parents were just trying to keep me occupied. Um, but every time I didn't know what a word was, I had to get down the dictionary um, and go look it up. So I spent a lot of time reading through the very, very old red Webster dictionary that was in our house. Um, anyway, the net result of this first step is that we wind up making a carbon boron bond. We added the hydride to the more substituted carbon, and then we have this carbon boron bond that forms. Um, and what, and so that's winds up being really useful in that we've broken the double bond, and now we have a carbon boron bond. And carbon boron bonds are not as strong as carbon carbon bonds, and we can basically we can remove the boron down the road with the second step of this reaction. Um, and if we look at what that transition state looks like, uh, so I'll, first of all, I'll just reiterate that we actually wind up doing that, that step three times for each boron. Each boron has three hydrogens around it. So each boron has three BH bonds that can be replaced with a BC bond, which is more stable than a BH bond. 
So we wind up making this, it's what's known as a trialkyl borane, where we wound up just replacing whatever our alkene was, we made a bond between the less substituted carbon of the, al of the alkene and the boron. We do that three times. And so once you've shown that if you're writing out a reaction or out a mechanism, um, if you show that step happening once, you can then just say, you know, times two or, you know, circle the whole thing and say times three to say that you're doing the same thing three times to get to this trialkyl borane. Um, no point in doing repetitive steps for no reason. Um, and, but if we look at the at the transition state, it really comes down to sterics as much as anything. In order to get this this um, hydrogen to add to the more substituted carbon, it's because otherwise we would have to make a transition state where the boron was bumping into these other carbons. So because the boron is just physically larger than the hydride, the hydride goes to this, the more cramped space and you attach the boron to the less substituted carbon. All right, and so this is the entire mechanism, the way it's shown in your textbook, or the, the mechanism for the oxidation part that's shown um, to, which is basically going to go through and remove the boron and replace it with an oxygen. Um, and it basically does the same thing again. As you make more, as you start replacing the hydrogen that's attached to boron with more and more electronegative elements, the, those bonds start being more and more stable. So the first step is you replace BH bonds with BC bonds. The next step is you replace BC bonds with BO bonds with boron to oxygen. And then you end up replacing those with more, with just OHs. You wind up just doing a substitution basically and removing the R group and replacing it with the hydrogen, right? And so again, I, this is, there's a lot on this figure. Um, I would encourage you to go to the textbook that has this written in there um, so that you can, you can really, you know, zoom in better than I can do here for you. Um, focus, get out the magnifying glass, whatever you have to, to be able to see the details. Um, it's got, but the oxidation step is a little bit weird. You have to, it's based, it's hydrogen peroxide and hydroxide together. So H2O2, this is hydrogen peroxide, which is a weak base. Um, and when you put it with hydroxide, you make this really, really unstable compound that's a peroxide ion. Um, and that's going to basically come in here, and you're going to wind up replacing um, that, that uh, boron carbon bond with, the, with an oxygen. You're going to basically insert an oxygen in between the boron and the carbon is the net result. And so you... So when you're, when we're doing this here, we wind up making this hydro, hydro peroxide um, ion, which comes in and is a really strong nucleophile, attacks the boron. And then once you've made, and the reason that this can happen is because boron, and I kind of glossed over this earlier. Let me skip back a couple of steps. Um, this sentence up here is what allows this to happen. The reason boron is so significant here is because that it has an incomplete valence, but it also has a neutral charge. Because when you look at BH3, if you count the number of, of valence electrons, you only have six valence electrons to work with, right? You physically can't fill boron's valence with if it's BH3 as borane. Um, but it's also neutral when you look at formal charge because boron only has three valence electrons on the periodic table, right? So it's neutral, but it also has an empty spot in the p orbital. 
And so what that allows it to do is go through these intermediates where all of a sudden it goes from having three things in attached to its valence, all of a sudden we attach another oxygen to it. It has room to go through these steps where all of a sudden we added an extra boron bond. And then it's going to rearrange itself to, again, only have three bonds. So its formal charge stays as three. Carbon doesn't do this, right? Carbon with an incomplete valence, super unstable. That's our carbocations. And it will do something very quickly to fill that. Um, boron, on the other hand, is fairly stable that way. And so we wind up making this boron with four bonds for a second. And then one of the carbons switches over to, to the oxygen. It's like a rearrangement reaction. Um, and in doing so, you lose the OH group. And you wind up making this BO to the R. Right, so that is a more stable series of bonds. Carbon to oxygen is more stable. Boron to oxygen is more stable. And once again, you're going to repeat that two more times until we've replaced all of the carbon-boron bonds with boron to oxygen to carbon. And then it just keeps going. Where we... Uh, just have bring in the hydroxide that was left over now can come in here and replace these these RO groups with OHs. So we just have nucleophilic attack leaving group leaves. And we wind up making our desired alcohol, which then just needs to be protonated to make it the alcohol step. All right, so a lot of steps here. It's definitely one of those things where you need to see it at least at least once before you would ever come up with this. Because before you see how weird boron is, you would never start by doing these steps, right? But once you see it, it's it's the same thing twice in a row. Oxygen comes in here, you migrate the carbon over, and then you do it two more times. And then the hydroxide comes in and attacks, and leaving group leaves. It's almost the opposite as well. It's almost boron allows it to be the opposite of an SN1 reaction too, right? SN1 reaction, leaving group leaves has to be the first step. And then a nucleophilic attack comes in. With boron having that empty spot in its valence, you can have nucleophilic attack first and then leaving group leaves. And the the structure for the exams is not going to change significantly there's going to be more of the exam is going to be on draw the major product for these than than it is for draw the mechanism there's gonna be like 20 points of do a mechanism so um i'm not going to ask you to do the mechanism every time the most important thing both points wise and as far as as moving along in the class is can you predict what the products are um, and if you happen to guess, guess right, and you just decide, I'm just not going to study for, you know, hydroboration oxidation, because that was a super complicated mechanism and I don't have time for that. You might get lucky and I might not ask about it. Um, but if you can know what the products are, at least that's super helpful, right? So let's practice with these. What's the net result of this reaction? going to be like a hydration where you get a hydroxyl group on the less substituted right the key aspects here is that it's going to be a hydration reaction but it's anti-markovnikov so if it's anti-markovnikov we're putting the oh on the less substituted carbon so for a we would get this molecule. What would we get for B? It 
it'd be the same, right? You put it on the less substituted end. Exactly. Hey, Sean, I got a real quick question. So yeah. then in the book, when I do the example, they add that hydrogen, but they put a bond there. Are you supposed to put a bond in the more substituted? If they like draw a line from, would be the less substituted carbon and they draw a line to a hydrogen. Yeah. Is that like, they put so, that in the book, do you have to do that? So that's that's why we're, it's not a bad idea. It's not technically, if, it, if we're drawing skeletal structure, we wouldn't draw that, right? Um, because we don't draw carbon hydrogen bonds for the sake of showing, you know, we're adding, we're, we are adding a water molecule to both sides, but we're adding it this way. Um, it's just, it's just giving you, you know, reminding you what's on the other side of that pi bond. What is, what else did we add? And you know, if I was being really careful about this, I would just redo these real quick. These are small. I've got we added a hydrogen here just to indicate that's what we added is the stuff in blue. And down here, added one, two, three, four, five. Those are the carbons that were there already. And now for consistency's sake, my OCD is telling me I have to add them the same way over here. All right, so everybody see that the red, the carbons, what we call, you'll frequently hear it referred to in OCHEM as the carbon skeleton, didn't change. We didn't move any carbon, carbon bonds. We didn't move any carbons around or even add any carbons. All we did was break the pi bond, add a water molecule. You just have to remember that if it's BH3 as your first step, you're going to be adding it the anti-Markovnikov addition. So then really only gets tricky when you have to keep all three of those straight in your head at the same time, right? When I have them all mixed together, it's just like when you learn nomenclature, right? Inorganic nomenclature was, was easy as long as you knew it was all covalent bonds or you knew it was ionic. As soon as I started mixing them together and you had to figure that part out, that's when things get tricky. Um, here's another one where we're, as long as we're focusing on this mechanism, this is going to make you think backward, like a synthesis reaction. And back before they had mass spec and NMR, this would actually be a pretty common way of figuring out what something was. I said, okay, well, I'm pretty sure that this is an alkene of some sort. So I'm going to react it through this, this specific reaction that I know only alkenes go through and then test properties of what comes out the other side. And then you can say, oh, the melting point that from what came out the other side shows that's clearly 2-methylbutanol. Um, so therefore, we could work backwards and surmise that we added, we did an anti-Markovnikov addition. So we added the OH to the less substituted carbon. So compound A would have to be, draw this, the carbon skeleton structure didn't change, would have to be this. Uh, 
Um, and this nomenclature there, we haven't added OHs or alcohol specifically to our nomenclature yet. Um, but anything that ends in OL, like the word alcohol does, is an alcohol. And so we actually just name alcohols the same way we would name an alkene. Um, I would write this as 2-methyl-1-butanol. Um, but this is the most most current and systematic way of doing it. Systematic way of doing it is to put the one in the middle of the word. I just don't like that because it doesn't roll off the tongue as well. 2-methyl-butan-1-ol um, versus I would write it as 2 methyl one butanol which makes me i guess old school but not as old school as the people that would name this as n butanol instead of one butanol before they commonly used that when they were still using iso and n and sec um as the prefixes they would name it as just two methyl as uh, methyl n butanol or something like that or Actually, they would probably name it as sec pentyl alcohol or something weird like that. So this way is at least more systematic than that. Um, this seems to be the wave of the future is, is things going that way. So I will accept either of them. They're both unambiguous um, if you know our rules, right? So if we have them all mixed together. They're all hydration reactions. We want to keep track of which ones can rearrange, which ones are Markovnikov, and which ones are anti-Markovnikov. They aren't all hydration reactions, right? F is not a hydration reaction. So I'll give you guys a few minutes on this. Let's let's say, um, take take ten minutes and work on this, and I'll put answers up and go through them um, when we hit uh, nine forty-five.
All right. I know I said 945, but seems like most of you guys have had a chance to work on this. And so I'll use the extra time to clarify if, uh, if anybody got different answers. So for the first ones on the left, our answers would look like this. Don't change the carbon skeleton. It's BH3, so anti-Markovnikov, add the OH. E is acid catalyzed hydration. If you don't have water written specifically as a reactant, but you have H3O written, that does have water then, right? Because after you deprotonate the H3O plus, you are left with water. So either way, when you see acid, your first thought should be make carbocation. Whatever's left can act as a nucleophile. So that means we're going to go through Markovnikov, add the OH to the more substituted group. It only gets tricky if there's a rearrangement, which there's not in this case, right? Because our carbocation intermediate is already on a tertiary carbocation. So we get this molecule. Hey, Sean, I got a quick question about that one. Yeah. Can there, would there only be a, met if there was a, like, there would only be a methyl shift there if that carbocation was next to that methyl that would have been that like a, a free methyl like because there's not a methyl on that peak carbon you can't yeah if we started with something like let's see try and keep it as similar as possible um if we had a double bond here instead of over here this double bond when you when you first protonate it and you make the carbocation if the carbocation was right here then you could have a methyl shift if the carbocation was if we started with this molecule we wouldn't have a methyl shift we could still have a hydride shift though right which would still wind up putting our OH group on the tertiary carbon here. So it's all about with the acid catalyzed hydration, it seems like it's, it's a much simpler mechanism, but there's that extra variable you have to consider of does it rearrange. Oxymercuration and the hydroboration, the mechanisms are more complicated, but that prevents any rearrangement from being an issue. For H, anti-Markovnikov, it's borohydride, borohydration, um, or hy sorry, hydroboration followed by oxidation. It's a proper name there. And with the hydroboration ones, we do have to remember that it only does the syn addition. So if, it, if there are two possible products, especially, so mostly that's going to show up if it's a ring structure. If it's a ring structure that already has something else on it. In this case, we wind up making um, two different stereoisomers because this is an asymmetric carbon, right? It has an OH, it has a cyclohexyl group, it has a hydrogen, and it has a methyl. So four different things attached. So you wind up making R and S, but the syn addition aspect doesn't have anything, doesn't change anything, right? Because it doesn't matter whether you add, if we look at the where we start over here, um, if you add the oxygen and the hydrogen both out towards us versus both of them away from us, it doesn't make a difference. You're just going to get the R versus the S. So as long as we know, and we were already, we already knew that because we made an asymmetric carbon and we started from something planar. Casey? Yeah, I was going to ask. So if it's not showing like a wedge or a dash, then we don't have to draw it in. Um. So this one is not going to have a wedge or a dash to begin with because this because alkenes are flat, they're planar. 
So it's starting planar, and that means there's a 50-50 shot of does the oxygen add on top of it or behind it, which is why we get R and S in our product. Um, the addition reactions for alkenes, the stereochemistry is typically actually relatively simple compared to some of the things we've dealt with because it starts flat, which means almost anything we're going to deal with is a 50-50 shot of, of adding on, on either side. When we start with something tetrahedral and then make it tetrahedral again, that's when we really have to be paying attention to which one did we start with. Thank you. No problem. Then for B and F, for B, we have oxymercuration, demercuration, so Markovnikov, but no rearrangement. So break the pi bond, add the OH on the more substituted carbon. Don't worry about rearrangement. If this was acid catalyzed react, um, hydration, we would have a methyl shift, right? Because we'd start by putting a plus charge right here on carbon two, and then we could migrate a methyl over to make it a tertiary. But because we use the oxymercuration, it won't rearrange. Then last but not least, it's not a hydration. Um, it's acid catalyzed, so we do need to worry about it rearrangement, but we're not adding an OH, we're adding a bromide. Um, and it is Markov acid catalyzed, goes through Markovnikov, follows Markovnikov's rule because that carbocation stability, but there's no rearrangement that can happen. Our positive charge should wind up on the tertiary carbon here, which means bromide would come in and attach to the tertiary carbon. And this one does not have any stereochemistry, right? Because both ways around this ring structure are identical. We can't tell the difference between the two of them. So that we only have three unique things attached an ethyl group, a bromine, and then both directions around the ring, which are identical. RJ? Yeah, uh, so like, the, so that number F, it, or letter F, it stays planar because of the alkene. Whenever that alkene breaks and the, and the bromine attaches, is that instantaneous or no? No, so it'll go through a carbocation intermediate that would look like Oh yeah, yeah, and the reason why I'm asking is because then doesn't wouldn't if it if that alkene keeps it planar when that alkene breaks does it then turn out of like come out of planar and then switch back into it whenever that bromine gets put onto it? So it'll it started planar and then when you make the carbocation intermediate the carbocation is also planar, like you were saying. Which but that means the bromine has a 50 50 shot. Does it come in from above or below? But okay. the difference with this specific compound is that this, it's still, it's going to be tetrahedral, but these two things are identical, these two bonds, because going around the ring structure this way is indistinguishable from going around the ring structure this way. So even though it's tetrahedral, it doesn't have an R and an S. Because if you took, if you think about it this way, Let's say we had that molecule just to show the structure there. If I switched the bromine and the ethyl, I could make it look like this again just by flipping it like a pancake, right? And we get the exact same molecule back. Okay. All it would take to make it asymmetric, though, would be if I did these two methyl groups not on carbon four of the ring. If I put them here, now you can tell the difference between which set way around the ring structure you went, right? Now you'd have to worry about R and S because trying to, if I switch these two, trying to flip it back, if I flip the molecule, I put the two carbons on the other side, right? 
So I picked that one carefully so that so that we could talk about the fact that it's not an R versus the S. Not because it's not tetrahedral, but because it's symmetrical. It's like it's the same as having two methyl groups that we can't tell the difference between. And would you look at that today marks the first lecture. We've actually finished right on time with all the slides done. So good work, everyone. Um, watch for the quiz later. We'll do a page similar to this. I might even just take this page and mix up what the reactants are. Um, be most of your quiz, and then I'll probably have you write out a mechanism too, um, just for some practice copying. And so go get it out of the book or get it from my slides um, for for the mechanism part. Um, and uh, don't be afraid to practice more than one of them. If I only ask you one of them, don't be afraid to go practice the other one too, even if it does take a whole page of of notes. Um, but other than that, everybody have a good weekend. I've got office hours at 1030 if anybody needs me. Um, otherwise, I will see you on Tuesday. Thanks, John. Bye, guys. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Welcome.